1972. A problem for George McGovern, a running mate named Tom Eagleton. As I said last night, it's the same thing as today. My spirits are high. The world will go on, and so will I. Dick Nixon has his back to the wall, his face on Russian television. I think we appreciate this opportunity. His second term, all wrapped up. In the World Series, it's the A's. In chess, Bobby Fischer. In the tank, Mark Spitz. And J. Paul Getty has a birthday, number 80. Arab terrorists get $5 million in one of 31 skyjackings. An extortionist bomb blew this one up. Some skyjackers are caught. Arabs terrorize the Olympics. And then there is Jackie. Jackie at her best. Body in motion, no makeup, hair blowing. The photographer is freelance Ron Galela, who just won't give up. Fame can be a problem. The photographer says Secret Service men shove him around. He sues, claims the bodyguards deprive him of his livelihood. Jackie countersues, charges invasion of privacy and harassment. See, she should have to be hounded by newsmen, um, press photographers, and everybody else, and, and the uh, peoples every time she goes out of her house. Uh, I'm here more or less as, uh, for the fun of the thing, you might say. When I, I, I presume that the... This man is suing for six million dollars, and it just seems kind of absurd. Anybody can sue anybody else for six million dollars. There's something crazy about the whole uh, society. Well, uh, why are you waiting here? I'm not waiting. I'm on jury duty here. It wasn't six million, only 1.3. But Jackie wins. Galela must stay 50 to 100 yards from Jackie, the kids, their schools, and home. Next case. Ah, oh, yes, the price of fame. Another celebrity is called to appear before a congressional committee. The question, did old blue eyes invest in a racetrack controlled by mobsters? Sinatra tongue lashes committee members for failing to challenge his accuser, an earlier witness. He chews them up and spits them out. He does it his way. Fame does have its pitfalls, but also its glories. What's it like to be famous? Gloria Swanson. Fame is a very curious thing. Some people can take it and some can't. Groucho. I'm proud of being famous. I've worked out all my life for this. Betty it's, Friedan. It's awesome in a way. Jake Javits. Fame makes you known and makes your ideas important. Cavett. There, there are times when it's just plain terrible. Raquel. Very, very nice. I mean, it's, uh, it's terrific. Rod Stewart. I'm not a superstar. I'm a singer of various songs, the superstars are a played out word that went out years ago. I'm not a superstar, a singer of songs, an entertainer of extraordinary talent. <laughs> I know it's really funny when you go into doctor's offices and things and you have to have examinations for a cold and you get sort of the full examination from top to bottom, inside out, and x-rays, and they put you in a little robe and march you down the hall and then you sit in a room somewhere and everyone comes in and looks at you, you know. I'd say most times with me, uh, it isn't pleasant. I'm proud of being famous. I've worked out all my life for this. I'm entitled to it. Mm -hmm. um, I could live in a dump instead of living here. But why should I? So I'll leave a little less money when I die. But I'm having a hell of a good time here. Munich. 8,500 athletes from 121 countries. Death is waiting for 11 young men. American Frank Shorter salvages a measure of U.S. pride in the marathon, though the U.S. gets only six golds in track and field, the American specialty. The Russians are the overall winners with 99 medals, 50 of them gold. The U.S. gets 94, 33 gold. But in basketball, the U.S. knows it will win, as it has in every Olympics test. Basketball is indigenous to America. But somehow the Russians are leading. The clock is running out. The U.S. team rallies. They score. A win. Or is it? Officials rule the scoreboard clock is wrong. The Russians win. Angry, the U.S. team refuses to accept the silver medal for second place. 
At 84 pounds, the crowd favorite is Russia's Olga Korbut, only 17. She wins two golds, a silver, and millions of hearts around the world. For the first time since the Nazis, Germany is hosting the Olympics. In the middle of the night, hooded Arabs, terrorists of Black September, raid the dormitory housing the Israeli athletes. Two Israelis are killed, nine are taken hostage. Release of 200 Palestinian terrorists from Israeli prisons is demanded. Golda Meir says, no deal. In an airport shootout, all nine hostages, five Arabs, and a policeman are killed. Olympic President Avery Brundage leads a memorial service as 80,000 people anguish over the senseless murders. Bodies of the Israeli athletes are flown home for a state funeral. Israel vows vengeance, and in coming weeks, there are reprisals. And there is much second guessing of how West Germany and Israel handled the situation at Munich. An expert on terrorism, Dr. Brenner. Well, in cases such as the Munich case where uh, uh, something political is demanded of some government, uh, in particular where something is where something's demanded of the form of releasing prisoners that the government holds, uh, I would say that the government in question has a, always the option of considering the prisoners that it holds as counter hostages for the release of the hostages seized by the terrorists. Uh, had I been in, uh, uh, had I been responsible for the Israeli government at the time of the seizure of the uh, Israeli athletes at Munich, uh, I should at least have thought very seriously of, of telling the terrorists that we would consider the prisoners that we, the Israeli government, were holding as uh, hostage for the release of the Israeli uh, athletes, and that we might consider executing them at two, for two or three to one. I wouldn't use this frivolously for, for uh, uh, circumstances that could be solved by other means. You know, if there's any, at any time, if there's another solution that's available, of course it would be preferable, as long as the solution is not simply surrender in such a way that you encourage repetition of the tactic. In an election year, a sitting president must practice his handshaking, sometimes seeking out hands of foreign dignitaries to demonstrate he has the world under control. The Nixon visit to China is hailed by him as a major milestone and by others as a triumph of pragmatism for both America and China. While the president is involved in intensive backstage talks, Pat keeps reporters and their cameras busy with her drop-in at a Chinese schoolhouse. On close inspection, Nixon finds there are a few cracks in the Great Wall, enough to let in some light. Enduring friendship is promised. Ravishing. Maggie Trudeau and Pierre greet the Nixons when the U.S. President and Pat come to Ottawa. It's all part of the Nixon foreign visit schedule, which has him, among other things, addressing Parliament. It has been said that Canada is bounded on the north by gold, on the west by the east, on the east by history, and on the south by France. Meanwhile, outside, the protesters can't decide if it's a peace rally or an independence protest. <laughs> this is a peace demonstration. This is not a peace demonstration. This is a demonstration for independence and socialism. Well, where's your gun? And so as we visit Canada, Halfway between the visit to the People's Republic of China and the visit to the Soviet Union, this is the hope that we have in mind. That these visits, all of them, will contribute to the goal of an open world in which there will not be walls that divide people, in which people can be different, different in their forms of government, competitive in many ways, but in which they can settle their differences by talking rather than fighting. The Canadian-American example is an example for all the world to see, and our visit here, we trust, will contribute to the strength 
and the vitality of that splendid example. A few months later, he's landing in Moscow, again ready to shake hands. President Podgorny and Premier Kosygin are in the welcoming committee to meet Air Force One. In nine days of talks, party chairman Brezhnev and Nixon work out agreements covering medicine, peace, environment, trade, and the sale of grain. Most important, they conclude 30 months of painstaking salt talks, signing an agreement to limit nuclear weapons. Everywhere they're applauding. The future president of the United States of America. The war isn't quite over, but Nixon is bringing some of the troops home from Vietnam. Thank you. His foreign visits bolstered his image. For an election year, the record's not bad. Though we may hear more about that keeper down at the Watergate. Still, he has Sammy Davis Jr. on his side. You're trying to shoot me in the back? No, no, no. I'm just covering this for Jet Magazine. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. About the world. On May 15th, George Wallace is campaigning in Laurel, Maryland. It's warm. He takes off his coat. Then... The would-be assassin is a chronic misfit named Arthur Bremer. Ladies and gentlemen, get back! Are you working against them? You people that are foreign, help get this crowd back out of the way. George Wallace is paralyzed for life. In 1963, he strode onto the national stage to block the path of the first black students at the University of Alabama. The government man at the scene is Deputy Attorney General Nick Katzenbach, who phones his boss, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, uh, I thought we should try to develop a plan about what you, what's going to happen when General Graham gets there. Uh, now, I, I'm not very much in favor of picking the governor up and moving him out of the way. I think it would be much better if we could develop some system you had enough people just to push him aside or something. I don't want to pick the governor up very much. Then, uh, if he still doesn't move, then we'll try to get by him. Pushing? By pushing a little bit. If he's able to keep the doors locked and actually keep them out, and it's, uh, it's going to require knocking them down, or some real forceful action, then they will pull away. And I've come here to ask you now for an unequivocal assurance that you will permit these students, who after all merely want an education at the great university... Well, now you make your statement, but we don't need you to make a speech. You make your statement. I will make my statement, Governor. I was in the process of making my statement. And I'm asking from you an unequivocal assurance that you will not bar entry to these students, to Vivian Malone and to James Hood, and that you will step aside peacefully, do your constitutional duty as governor. Uh, is he getting to talk to the governor? President Kennedy nationalizes the Alabama Guard. General Graham asks Wallace to step aside. He is stepping aside. Governor Wallace has stepped aside. None too soon for many. Move, get out of the way, and decide. You and God get together on whether you love me or not. Color has nothing to do with it. You just happen to be standing in the way. You could be green, you could be plaid, you could be pink, you could be anything. You just happen to be white. Get on out of the way and let us move into the American society as free people, as human beings. We don't inflict our way of life upon them, and neither do they inflict their way of life upon us. The Southern Negro is a happy, carefree individual and an affectionate person too uh, in their feelings of respect with the white people but we also respect them too we have a very deep respect for their way of life and for their ways of thinking we think differently we definitely think differently reverend wyatt lee walker discrimination affects everything you do Everything you feel, everything you hope for, uh, everything you imagine, everything you dream. Uh, 
when you wake up in the morning and at least when I start shaving, you know, bam, it hits me, you know, you're a Negro. To have your child ask you, why can't I go to this school? Or why is that a white school? Or why can't I go to Fun Town, a recreational park? Do white people hate me because my skin is black? Uh, why are Negroes lynched? Isn't this America? When the black vote becomes a significant factor in Alabama politics, Wallace solicits black support. He can be governor as long as he wants, but his White House hopes are over. One of George McGovern's many concerns in his campaign for the presidency is the psychiatric history of his running mate, Senator Thomas Eagleton. It's hot here tonight, and Eagleton perspires even on Christmas Eve. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. I can take the heat, and I'm going to stay in the kitchen. He's on the ticket, and there won't be any further change and, uh, uh, until he and I have had a chance to talk, and there may not be any change then. You are still deliberating, then. I'm, I'm with Senator Eagleton all the way until he and I have had a chance to talk. Did you find, during this period of exhaustion, that it affected your ability to make rational judgments and decisions? No, I was in, in a position to make rational judgments and decisions. I was depressed. My spirits were depressed. That's a manifestation along with the stomach upset, as I previously described it. That was a manifestation of this exhaustion and fatigue that I've heretofore described. He discussed with me this morning, which is exactly what he has just told you here uh, now, he would still have been my choice for the vice presidency of the United States. But things can change. The Democratic Party and the nation in 1972 are unity and a full discussion of the real issues before the country. Continued debate between those who oppose his candidacy and those who favor it will serve to further divide the party and the nation. Therefore, we have jointly agreed that the best course is for Senator Eagleton to step aside. And then there's Watergate. In 72, all we know for certain is that someone, apparently only a few Cubans, broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. Security guard Frank Wills. On making security check, I found that the latch on the basement door had been uh, taped. Uh, making public security checks, I returned later to found that the same door had been retaped again, the latch. At that time, I Nixon's campaign that. manager and his former attorney general. Mr. Mitchell, don't you think it would sort of remove the political fuse from this case as far as the administration is go, it goes if some high official would uh, uh, concede some knowledge or some blame or some involvement in this? That's an uh, absolutely ridiculous question. Mm -hmm. Why should they when they don't have the knowledge? That's yeah, what yeah. we've been trying to get across to you. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. Now, if it hadn't been for those White House tapes. What's going on there? In 72, they call it Boogie, a new name for rock and roll, a revival to keep the business going during days when 60s music seems burned out and its replacement hasn't been found. And to me, these younger people are just victims of noise pollution and consumerism. But being a rock jock, I had to learn a brand new style. And the style was, uh, we call, uh, it's an inside joke. Uh, Hi, Frankie Fun from Radio One. Tons of fun. Yours for your song. These many minutes long in this ocean motion of melody. I'll be here all day and bring you cheer on that way, you know. And guys, get into that bag. The rock revival is declared official in October when Elvis, Chuck Berry, and Ricky Nelson all hit the top five on the singles charts simultaneously. I think the kids today should know some of the history and some of the roots of rock and roll that they're hearing. You know, jazz and rock and roll <clears throat> began in the very same place, you know, with, blue, with blues. Jazz, with blues and kids, jazz is fast and rock is... Yeah, jazz, jazz is fast, crazy, and rock is uh, 
Sweat. Shake it, Mama. Rock star Jerry Garcia. Any musician who's making records, who's appearing, doing things like that, is basically, they're working for some unknown group of businessmen somewhere. And, uh, that's an unfortunate thing. That's a, that's that's another yet another aspect of the revolution. You know, why is something like music a business? It's not a business, really. In 1972, the sales of records and tapes come within an eyelash of two billion dollars. It's a rock and roll world. The play opening at this theater on Broadway is by a man who revolutionized black movies, Melvin Van Peebles. But can he live up to the promise of his first fantastic success? You see, um, I was originally an author. I've written a lot of novels that have had published, etc. However, I have the, uh, the highest return on bread uh, um, this year in Hollywood and probably um, for the last a few years. The American system, um, the man has an Achilles pocketbook. If you can show that um, your product has a financial short-term return for him, um, he'll deal with you. Sweet Sweet Back's badass song, um, people say may revolutionize their industry. You know, it's bull. It has revolutionized the industry. Small, cheaply made uh, film can still be commercially feasible. Um, has put in the hands of third world disenfranchised people the possibility of making their own films. Sweetback made uh, five million dollars, I think, before three white people in America had ever seen the film. That we will control our destiny in the future. Yes. that um, there'll be more and more sweetbacks, much better by other people who are having their minds decolonized. That's just where it's at, baby. I think um, the new technology in cinema, and especially the new technology in cinema as pointing the way through sweetback, um, has signaled the downfall of the old Hollywood. That's where it's at, baby. 1972, in Ireland, Bloody Sunday. Death comes to a beloved president, the one who beat Tom Dewey. I admired him when he walked out on the Southerners, you remember? Yes. That time, and uh, I was always proud of him for that and desegregating the armed forces and the Navy. Of course, I wasn't so crazy about Hiroshima, but who was? The most powerful cop in the history of America dies in his sleep. Godfather is the movie. Angela Davis is the cause, and she is freed. Jane Fonda is still fighting the war, but the troops are coming home. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get home? <laughs> when a lady tells all about a novelist lover, who's writing about a mystery man, somebody sometimes goes to prison. Vancouver, March 13th. Howard Hughes takes over the top floor of the Bayshore Hotel. No one has seen him, but the Bayshore's manager says it's true. We're still uh, trying to uh, come out from under the shock of this. However, uh, gee, it's, uh, it's been an interesting experience to uh, have such a guest as Mr. Hughes here. There are rumors Cliff Irving's book about him is a hoax. Says one reporter, I think he's a genuine eccentric. I did a story that hasn't been published yet, uh, talking to seven or eight of the women in Hollywood he squired around before he eventually married uh, Jean Peters. And each of them praised him a great deal as a very generous man, a very kind man, a thoughtful man. But he did have eccentricities. One time he was playing golf with uh, Paulette Goddard, and he used to give her a stroke a hole until uh, one day she beat him. But he never played golf with her, yeah. And he was dating her regularly. 
And another time he, he flew uh, Terry Moore to, to the Grand Canyon in his own private constellation, a huge airplane, just the two of them in the cockpit. They landed there and they found out they only had 40 cents between the two of them for lunch. Is Howard really up there? There's not much in the, of a story in, for Hughes. I think the story now is uh, what the reporters are doing to try to get to Hughes. This has got the local angle because there's been a lot of other nights when I haven't interviewed Howard Hughes either, but this 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 was the night I didn't interview him in Vancouver. I can't find him. As Howard watched the sunset on peaceful Vancouver, elsewhere... Cliff is here. Cliff has said through me that he has met with Mr. Hughes. The book is authentic. We are sure the book will be published. The book speaks for itself. Who's got the money? Do you want that book? I'm sorry, I've got no comment. Will you meet with us when your voice is better? Thank you very much. What? Will you meet with us when your voice is no, better? No, this is probably the most horrible experience that I've ever gone through to see a gang you of have, guys. Will you meet with us when you're better? Would right you please place, answer please. that? I'll answer that when I'm better. Cliff, Cliff, do you have any... I'll tell you something. Cliff. This isn't really my cup of tea, this kind of thing. Danish folk singer Nina Van Palen says she was in Mexico with Cliff when he says he was talking to Hughes. She's sure there was no time for talking. Finally, Cliff admits all. The hoax is over. Parts of the book he invented, the rest he plagiarized. Checks to H.R. Hughes, deposited in Swiss banks by Cliff's wife, Edith, went into the account of Helga R. Hughes, the name on her fake passport. Edith and Irving and Cliff's researcher, Richard Suskind, all go to jail for a time, no one for more than a year and a half. That manuscript Irving stole from was written by an ex-Hughes Tool official and a reporter, James Phelan. A movie executive asked Irving to look it over, and Cliff made a copy. For a time, only Phelan knew fact from fancy. I think he made up a great deal of it. They've now uh, found out that, uh, that uh, at least three very long and rather exciting uh, passages uh, that did not come out of my manuscript what are they uh, totally from? false. And this involves uh, Hughes uh, meeting with um, Albert Schweitzer. It involves uh, Hughes uh, meeting Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and also, I think, a trip to Ethiopia. Now, independent research has, has shown that these things didn't happen. And uh, so he apparently just made them up. He's, he's a novelist, and he, he created it. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to show you the most stupendous sight in the whole world. An entire race of people eating themselves to death. eating an awful lot of food, and we're satisfied. Well, this really is what it's all about. Very difficult for me to say no to one slice of cheese. I, my problem is that I eat too much. Down for with chocolate. Good rye bread with lots of butter. <laughs> <laughs> In 1972, a few people began to pay attention to what they eat. Too much sugar, too much salt, too much cholesterol. Quick, fast, minute, instant. The food industry is geared to speed. Too often, quick fat and too little nutrition. But some folks are working it off, mostly the affluent and the vain. It's high-priced working off, where you pay for the privilege. Health clubs spring up like money-fertilized mushrooms. Some are running off those fat stomachs, but many become more aware of what's going into them. Food expert Robert Choate. We're going to have to depend upon nutritionists who are more than company hacks, who in effect tell us what really is in the food supply and what good it is doing for us. I think we're going to have to develop a, an ethic 
in the food merchandising industry that is not there today, which in effect will guarantee to us that as we walk down the supermarket aisle, we'll be getting stuff that is good for us as well as something that'll fill our gut. With everything from alfalfa sprouts to zinc tablets, the health food industry grows like a weed. Sales quadruple in two years. It looks a little like bird seed, but how does it taste? This is really good. I don't know what it is. It's apricots and sesame seeds and sunflower seeds. And um, it's delicious. It's, been a, it's just delicious. Well, I think uh, natural foods are, are better because uh, they taste better. They do taste better, and they're not putting the chemicals on. I don't know whether that really makes them better or not, but at least I feel more confident in eating them without a lot of, uh, a lot of extra stuff on them. And uh, because there hasn't been too much proof one way or the other, that's just it. The uncertainty kind of bugs me, and I'd rather eat, eat a more certain product. Will the next generation be healthier, or will it be fatter? The parents of these kids want them to have chemical-free food, and the only way to be sure about that is to grow your own. I think there's nothing like natural foods when you take something right out of the ground, which you've grown and which no one else has grown or done anything with. And you cook it or you eat it raw, like peas or turnips or anything. There's a taste that you just can't get any other way. Is it all worth it? It's a whole food because it hasn't been broken down or candied or cooked to the point where there isn't anything left in it except the appearance of food. Whoops! Depending on whose figures you accept, maybe half the population is overweight. It all started in India about 500 A.D. The Persians found it there and during the days of Muslim conquest carried it to North Africa and then to Europe. The game is chess. In the closest thing to a World Series chess lovers have ever known, Brooklyn's Bobby Fischer is challenging world champion Boris Spassky. Bobby's antics infuriate everyone. There have been seven straight draw games. Bobby leads, a crucial game. The 21st game is adjourned overnight. The referee gets a note. Mr. Spassky has resigned. For the first time, an American is chess champ of the world. My goal now is to play a lot more chess. I felt I'd been, you know, handicapped by not having the title. I couldn't get, you know. What can you do with the title? How can you play more Well, chess? make your own sort of conditions more, I think. Will you try to play many of the matches in the U.S.? I might, yeah, you know. You know I'm not going to commit myself. I'd like to play a match in the States. But uh, the main thing I want to do is play more chess. I feel I haven't played enough chess. Uh, yeah. Spassky obviously would disagree with that. But <laughs> Bobby Fischer's shows of temperament, calculated to rattle Spassky, wouldn't have worked against this opponent, the computer. The computer will examine all its possible moves and ring a bell every time that it finds that it has no way to save its pawn or knight or bishop. A real panic situation. The computer cannot learn at this point in the context of what uh, people would, uh, would uh, define as learning. There's no chess program in existence that really learns. A uh, Stanford professor, Arthur Samuels, wrote a checker plane program which learns to a certain degree. The checker plane program right now is as good as uh, the state champion, roughly, of Connecticut. But chess is much more complicated than checkers, and nobody has attempted to build learning into, checker, uh, into chess programs the way they have into checker programs. It's my guess that it's at least five to ten years away. A computer is really a robot, a word coined by a playwright in 1921. Scientist Isaac Asimov. There is no theoretical limit whatever to how complex robots can be and how close to human intelligence they can come. The human brain is made up of atoms and molecules and nothing else. 
And if we can invent a robot which, is made, which has a brain that is made up of units as small as those of the human brain, as complex as those of the human brain, and is as intricately interrelated as those of the human brain, you all have the equivalent of the human brain with everything there is in a human brain. So look out, Bobby Fischer. But nowhere is technology more awesome than in the arms race. Words like MIRVs and ICBMs, they're in the headlines, along with another word, money. Defense costs are $85 billion a year, a third of the U.S. budget. Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern. I fully understand the dangers of war and the needs of security and adequate defense. But the desire for more money and for new weapons seems to have no limit at all. We reduce our involvement in Vietnam and military spending goes up. We sign an arms control agreement with the Russians and military spending goes up. We open up new relations with China and military spending goes up. I call for an end to military waste in the defense budget. President Nixon says there's danger of the United States becoming a second-rate power. The Pentagon claims the Soviets have an edge in nuclear strength. Ironically, the Nixon budget increase is largely consumed by inflation and Vietnam. Thoughtful citizens are concerned the president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Jerome Wisner. Large-scale industrial organizations in this country, and the mili large military, and I think the mirror image of it in the Soviet Union, which is much harder to see, have been forces which have tended to escalate the arms race. They've created new weapon systems. They've been uh, very vocal proponents of the new weapon systems. The, the uh, fact that congressional uh, groups uh, could vie for uh, plants and contracts and so on has made uh, them less than critical sometimes of what was going on. One man says, not to worry, world leaders don't think about nuclear war. The Hudson Institute's Herman Kahn. The usual picture of everybody jumping into a war big because they want to is very, very unlikely. Uh, the United States, the Soviet Union are terrified of nuclear war. And they go to nuclear war, they'll be dragged in kicking and screaming, not jumping in, you understand? Uh, I have friends of mine, particularly pacifists, who think that if they President Nixon gets out in the morning, says, can I press the button now? Who say, no, why don't you have breakfast first? <laughs> you know, can I have it now? No. Uh, why don't you see the Boy Scouts first and so on? Actually, I bet you neither the Prime Minister of Russia nor the President of the United States really knows where the button is. They don't think in those terms. In Vietnam, in the remote areas, life can sometimes still be simple. Though the barbed wire reminders are always there. March, 1972. The Paris peace talks collapse. North Vietnam launches a strong offensive. Many South Vietnamese cities and villages are captured. The U.S. helicopters evacuate friendly Vietnamese. Oh, they're afraid that uh, when, when the chopper will pick them up to the district, the little kid will die because they stay uh, the up to the helicopter. When they take them up, will kill the kids. Military casualties are high and thousands of South Vietnamese civilians, those that survive, are uprooted. Are the survivors the lucky ones? The evacuees, homeless, are often separated from their families. The social and economic stability of the entire country has been shattered.
President Nixon increases the bombing and mines the harbors, but he is bringing the foot soldiers home. Well, he's been walking since early this morning, walking the last couple of days pretty steady with full pack on and been burning a lot of hooches and stuff. Man, it's just rough, this humping. <laughs> I really don't think too much of this war. Really, I think that uh, we're not fighting it as much as we should be. Really, I think we ought to go all out and win this war. Most of us want to get it over with and get home. Once was a good day, Charlie was a tragic and day. She picked up the truck as his wife and children went to join the NVA. But did he ever return? No, he never returned, and his fate's just been confirmed. He was shot by me because he was snapping from a tree. That's how Charlie got out of NBA. For thousands of Americans, the war is over. By December, only 27,000 men remain, 5% of the 1969 troop strength. Front you on, it still needs pleasing. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Stay that way this time. How do you feel about going home? Oh, well, it's great, man. It's been a long time. I want to go back. <laughs> In Northern Ireland, one side wears no uniforms. British troops, called to break up a protest march, kill 13 Catholics. The question is, who fired first? Bernadette Devlin. Do you feel any share of responsibility in what happened yesterday? This day? No, we had 20,000 people marching on our streets. The streets belong to us. We have a right to be there. We had 3,000 soldiers with no right to be there, enforcing by brutality and force of arms a law which a prime minister who has no mandate to govern any longer and no right to make that law made, Seven Catholic priests call a press conference. We accuse the colonel of the parachute regiment of willful murder. We accuse the commander of land forces of being an accessory before the fact. We accuse the soldiers of shooting indiscriminately into a fleeing crowd, of gloating over casualties, of preventing medical and spiritual aid, reaching some of the dying. It is untrue that shots were fired at the troops in Roswell Street before they attacked. It is untrue that any of the dead or wounded that we attended were armed. Well, this, of course, is ridiculous. Uh, there was a Thompson submachine gun which uh, opened fire, fired between 15 and 25 rounds, I would suspect. A, um, an M1 carbine actually fired at me as I traversed across the open ground. Two, maybe three shots, you don't stop to count them when you're on the move but certainly two shots from an M1 carbine. The Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, John Lynch. I'm fully satisfied that there was an unprovoked attack by British troops on unarmed civilians in Derry yesterday. Any claim to the contrary increases and continues the provocation from which 13 civilians died yesterday. The ambassador in London is being recalled. A legend who outlived his own time. The 48-year reign of J. Edgar Hoover ends with his death at 77. Over those years, he served eight presidents, going all the way back to Calvin Coolidge. In early years, it was build up the files of fingerprints. But in 34, the G-men were given the right to carry guns, and they dropped John Dillinger on a Chicago street. They caught Lindbergh kidnapper Bruno Hoffman, and atomic secret spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. After the war, Hoover focused on the communist problem. FBI tapes of Martin Luther King's private life were widely leaked, one of many indiscretions in Hoover's last days. And Harry Truman, the 33rd president, the man who succeeded Franklin Roosevelt is dead at 88. Sworn in in the early months of FDR's fourth term, Harry made some of the toughest decisions of all time. None tougher than whether to drop the bomb. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. 
the Berlin blockade. Rather than allow the Russians to close it off, he fed and clothed the city with the famous Berlin airlift. When one of America's most popular generals gets too big for his britches, Truman fires Douglas MacArthur. The cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. Always folksy, sometimes feisty, his morning walk became a ritual. His duet with Union President James Petrillo, a classic. 1972, give him hell. <laughs>